Let's pray before we begin. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for being with us here today. Each one who comes here comes with experiences and challenges, responsibilities, leading their churches in prayer. They get a lot of different requests for prayer. I pray that you'd guide us in our thoughts today in Jesus' name, amen. I uh, received a quest, request online. <laughs> um, today, actually, and it said, um, it was a request wondering what to do. And uh, this man said, um, please help me. Help me to know how to deal with anger for the man that uh, had an affair with my wife. So you can pray for a person like that, but there's a lot of other dynamics involved, aren't there? And so, uh, prayer and action for relationships. And I have an idea that probably a lot of the things that you have requests for, for prayer, have to deal with relationships. Uh, not only family relationships, husband, wife, son, daughter, relatives, but church relationships. And... Uh, church, uh, factions within the church, some people that won't speak to other people. So uh, you can pray for those persons, but um, how can we act out our prayer? In other words, how can we pray intelligently for people who have very relational issues? And you're probably acquainted with a lot of the things that we'll talk about today, but just by way of review and to inform our prayers. Um, this previous slide was uh, Dr. Neil Nedley. How many of you have uh, heard him on the TV or in person? What about his, his seminar on emotional intelligence? Have you heard the seminar on emotional intelligence? Okay, some have. I would encourage you to go online and just type in Dr. Nedley's sermon on emotional intelligence. And uh, you can watch there his, one of his latest sermons. But he mentions, by way of acknowledging what emotional intelligence is, uh, number one is knowing our emotions. And to know our emotions, we know what we are feeling and why we're feeling the way that we, about the thoughts that we have. And he mentions that our feelings come from our thoughts. We just studied in our Sabbath school lesson in the book of Ephesians, uh, the, the fact that we, we are known by our conversation. <clears throat> when our conversation comes out of our thoughts, and that's really who we are. And so uh, our emotions come from our thoughts. Now he says that 80% of the thoughts that we have are negative. Now this is, I hope it's not talking about born again Christians, but I think as, as a population, um, the consensus is that 80% of the thoughts that people have in a normal way uh, are negative. And then he says that 95% of those negative thoughts are repetitive. And of course, we can have uh, a lot of thoughts, you know. Uh, five thoughts, up to 12 thoughts in a short period of time. Well, the second aspect of emotional intelligence is managing our emotions. So, how do we manage our emotions? And um, number three, recognizing emotions in others or empathy. 
And so much of relationship has to do with understanding why we are feeling the way we feel and understanding why other people feel the way they feel and being able to empathize, uh, being able to understand where the person is coming from and, and feel the way that that person is feeling. And number four is managing our relationships with others and motivating ourselves to achieve our goals. <clears throat> you know, there's so many different kinds of conflicts that come up. Uh, a man tries to meet with a principal and he has some concerns about his son or his daughter in school and the principal is harried trying to close out the day and the man feels like he's being ignored and uh, it grows into a conflict and so there's always those kinds of potentials and then someone calls a prayer team and say well we'll pray for so and so you know he's not coming to church anymore and so you pray for him but also it helps to know how to relate to uh, the various situations. Well, we, last time we talked about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And uh, I shared this book, Fires of Pentecost on the Battlefront. Are there those here who were uh, not here last time that did not receive one of these? And I'm we're distributing these one per family unit. And uh, I have a man who is, uh, has the gift of helps, he and his wife, and they have provided these. They're kind of expensive, but he's provided these free of charge. So if you did not get one of these, one per family unit, uh, and we'll talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, like we did in the last seminar, only relate this to relationships. So how does the Holy Spirit empower our relationships? I still have my... Okay. <clears throat> it's beautiful that <laughs> they fruit of the Spirit really deals with things that are involved in relationships. Love, of course, is the primary fixer for relationships. Peace and joy, long-suffering, uh, that's essential in relationships. Goodness, meekness, temperance, faith, and the goodness in the original is a Greek word that means kindness. It's interesting that these are fruits. So you can claim the promise for the fruits of the Spirit for people that are in conflict, and you can share those with the members, like in a family, if a wife says, pray for my husband, he's left, or pray for my wife. Um, and you can share some of these thoughts on the fruit of the Spirit. It's an interesting thing about uh, fruit of the Spirit. In the Greek, it's singular. It's of the Spirit. It comes from the Spirit. And yet, even though it's singular, it has all of these different aspects. And so I think of the fruit as a cluster of grapes. And in that cluster, you have individual groups, and each of those has a different quality. But have you ever noticed that at least in grapes that have not been cultivated without seeds, they have seeds inside them? And that seed, the grape itself was intended not only for food, but it was intended for food for that seed. Because then it falls down and it grows and starts producing, and the grape becomes fertilizer for it. And I think that 
We could liken that individual grape in the cluster to an experience. Uh, we experience those things, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, meekness, temperance, faith. And uh, how do we do that? We'll talk about this in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But love is one of these fruits. And that's a fertile arena for the seed to take root. And the greatest need of the world today is the need for love and for need for, for Jesus. So if we have the fruit of the Spirit, that's a natural place for that seed to be planted where it can produ produce fruit. When you think about the needs of society today, one of the greatest needs is the need for self-worth. Of course, there's an everlasting quest for happiness, harmonious meaning, patience, healed relationships, power to live, trust, giving in relationships. Have you noticed how the fruit of the Spirit meets these needs? For instance, uh, how is self-worth really built up through the fruit of love? You know, we love because He loved us. And if we are loved in the midst of a baptism of the Holy Spirit, that increases our self-worth. Oh, joy. You know, the, the Bible mentions many times that we are to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Well, that's a fruit of the Spirit. Uh, the Bible says that they were filled with joy and the Holy Ghost. Those go together. And so if we have genuine joy, that's going to meet our need for happiness. Peace. Wow, how the world needs peace. And sometimes our patients are tried, and that's one of the most difficult things to deal with. But that's a fruit of the Spirit, is long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. All of these things actually meet the needs of the world today. So how does a baptism of the Holy Spirit provide the fruit of the Spirit uh, for healed relationships. Well, reading this from the Desire of Ages, it says the disciples often witnessed Christ kneeling in prayer, their hearts broken and humbled as their Savior, or as their Lord and Savior rose from his knees. What did they read in his countenance and bearing? That he was braced for duty and prepared for trial. So there's something that happens with the baptism of the Holy Spirit that changes even our countenance and it changes our inner core of being, uh, strengthens. He was braced for duty and prepared for trial. From the hours spent with God, he came forth morning by morning to bring the light of heaven to men. Daily he received a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. I can remember uh, not, a, not necessarily praying for the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but I grew up on the Olympic Peninsula and went to uh, Auburn Academy, graduated from there and then on to Walla Walla College. But after graduating from, Walla Walla, or from Auburn Academy, I thought, I was actually converted when I was 17 years old. Uh, I was raised in an Adventist home, but I'd always wanted to play football. And uh, so my junior year, we had a 10th grade school in Bellingham. And after the 10th grade school, I stayed out and worked a year. And then I went to Mount Baker High School and, and played football. So the games were on Friday nights and on Sabbath sometimes. So I was very careless in regards to the church and the Lord. I, I didn't exactly become rebellious, but uh, I was really, I had a foot in the world for sure. But 
Uh, it's a long story, but I decided that if I was going to be a Christian, I was going to be a wholehearted Christian. So I was rebaptized at Auburn Academy. And then I thought, well, Christians, what they do is they go, they become call porters. So I'm going to go into call porter work. I was uh, a very quiet person and uh, it was not very easy to knock on doors, but I thought that's what I should do. So I remember um, learning a canvas and going up and knocking on a door and uh, there was a sign out in front on the gate there that said, we shoot every third salesman. <laughs> the second one just left. So <laughs> I was uh, a bit nervous and, uh, and I rang the doorbell and we're told that when you go up and you knock on the door that you take three steps backwards so it doesn't look like you're trying to force your way in. Well, it was kind of a short porch, and then I took three steps backwards. The third step, I was off the porch, and it was a fairly high step. And I was walling around there in the flower bed, and the lady came to the door, and I pulled myself up to the step, and I said, you don't want to buy any books, do you? And she said, no. So that was my experience in starting out the call porter work. And, uh, of course, I wanted to quit, but then I was reading Call Porter Ministry, and it said... It is not the capabilities you now possess or ever will have that will give you success in this work, but it's what God can do for you. Wow. That was good news. And so with that promise in mind, I continued in the Cole Porter work. I did it for four summers, became the student leader and president of the Cole Porter Club. It's not what we can do, it's what God can do. I remember starting out as a pastor in a small church, and I was interned there with a senior pastor, and uh, they were building this church next uh, adjacent, which was part of that district, and he gave me that one church, and they were building, doing construction, and so I worked on the construction. We finished that construction. I decided to hold meetings that night. We started meetings, and I looked out in the audience, and there was not one uh, guest there. They were all church members. So as I was driving home, I was upset with God, and I said, you called me to this work, where are the people? And I remember pounding my fist on the steering wheel of the car and saying, you know, where are the people? And then the Holy Spirit spoke to me and rec made me recognize the awesomeness of the God in whose presence I was, and I said, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I just want to be your boy. And I realized that I was concerned for my own success. And so the next night, I just preached a simple sermon and gave a call, and there were 15 people that came forward. And I began to learn a little bit about what it is like to work with God and to recognize our weakness and realize it's not about what we can do, but what God can do. And so I had a friend who was a pastor. His name was Burton Maxwell. I inside of this book, if you have the book, I dedicated that book to Burton. Now, Burton is one who taught me to pray. And um, he actually came out and, and visited in my, in my district when I was a young pastor. <laughs> I don't think I'd even been ordained yet. And he told me about his prayer life. And he said that he sometimes prays up to two hours a day. And he said that he started praying uh, because he wanted to get out of the district he was in, and he had to be a success in order to get out of that district. And he knew that God would bless him if he prayed. So he prayed and prayed, and sure enough, he began to be a blessing and baptizing people. And uh, Burton would pray in the bathtub, and he would pray in the back seat of the car. And... <laughs> It kind of rubbed off on me, so I would, I learned to pray. But when I first started to pray, uh, uh, it is like Burton said that he first tried to pray for 10 minutes, and so he would say everything he knew to pray, and then we'd look at his watch, and a couple of minutes had gone. So he'd repeat his same prayer over and over again. 
And so I remember starting to pray, and uh, I was outside, and then I prayed, and uh, only a few minutes went by. And so then I just started talking to God, just asking him different questions. And I just would ask God, uh, you know, as I was walking outside, I would just say, well, God, it's wonderful out here. It's nice to be able to be outside. But I'm just thinking about what Burton said, and why is it that I can only pray for a few minutes? And why is it I don't seem to, to sense that you're actually here? You said that we, when we pray, we must believe that you are and that you're a rewarder. And uh, text of Scripture will begin to come to my mind. And as I would ask a question, then the text of Scripture would come to my mind, and I would repeat the text of Scripture back to him. You know, Martin Luther said that when his friend Melanchthon was ill, that he was asking for his recovery, and he said he prayed, but he said, I attacked the throne of grace with his own weapons. And what were his own weapons? They were the words of Scripture, things that God himself had said. Now, you know, we don't speak in those crude terms about attacking God's throne, but you can understand that there is a kind of a fortress involved there. And it's not that God is unwilling, it's that our mind that needs to be furnished with the power of the Scripture in order to become a believer. And so I found myself uh, praying with Scripture and praying out loud, uh, studying the Bible, and then praying. And I, could, I found that I could spend quite a bit of time in prayer. And the Lord began to bless. And uh, I found that, uh, you know, people were being baptized. The Lord was blessing our ministry. Uh, we were called to a larger church in Corvallis. And I continued this prayer life. I like to walk outside and pray. And we had a uh, historian, church historian, that came to, that, to the conference, and he gave a lecture. It was Maxwell. And he gave a lecture on why it was that uh, there were times when Ellen White says that the Lord could have come, and he didn't come. Uh, one of those was in 1844. You know, she said, that could have been it. And I thought, wow. Then in 1888, there was a movement of the Holy Spirit, and she said that Christ could have come at that time. And Maxwell went on to point out that as he studied the historical background, he found that there was a great revival, there was a great emphasis on the Holy Spirit, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the latter rain. And uh, Jones and Wagner were preachers of righteousness by faith, and Ellen White said that this was... Uh, Righteousness by faith and the latter rain go hand in hand. And, uh, but Maxwell went on to say that the problem was that they did not follow on to know the Lord. That book, that text in Hosea. And let's, let's look at that text in Hosea. I think it's chapter 6. It says, Then shall they know as we if we follow on to, to know the Lord, uh, the former and the latter reign in due season. And this in my King James Bible is Hosea chapter 6, verse 3. It says, Then shall we know if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come to us as the rain, as the former rain, as the latter and the former rain unto the earth. And he pointed out that what happened is that because they had that revival, but where they failed is they followed, they failed to follow on to know the Lord. So as I was praying, I asked God about that. I said, and this was at Corvallis, uh, the Lord had been blessing there. And I said, if that's true, what hope is there for me? If the pioneers, you know, James White, these people, these stalwarts, if they fail to follow on to know the Lord, what hope is there for me? And, and I was just agonizing about that. And I said, well, what, what are we going to do with this? How can I deal with that? 
And uh, so texts of Scripture began coming to my mind. Texts of Scripture that talk about Christ and His righteousness and that it's not what God thinks of us, but what God thinks of Christ. And uh, that we should not, you know, we should not try to lift ourselves by the bootstraps. It's for what He's done for us. We need to be receivers of His righteousness. And as I was thinking about that and claiming those promises, where it says that we're not to think about what God thinks of us, but what God thinks of His, of his Son. Well, what does He think of His Son? He always did those things that please the Father. He gives that righteousness to us. We're to see how God sees us through the eyes of a Father and His Son. And I said, if that's true, if you see me the way that you see Jesus, what you said to Jesus when he was baptized, you said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Wait a minute. Now, this sinful human flesh, you well pleased? <laughs> I, don't th I don't know. I'll never mention that to anybody. I went in... <sighs> and picked up Desire of Ages that I was reading. And it said that the same voice which spoke to Jesus speaks to every believing soul, this is my beloved son, my beloved daughter, in whom I am well pleased. Now, how does righteousness by faith get any better than that? And I thought, I wonder if that was a baptism of the Holy Spirit. See, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a baptism of assurance, a baptism of love. And if you look at the experience of Jesus when he experienced the daily baptism of the Holy Spirit, it, it came at his water baptism. And we're told that he was in agony. Why was he in agony? Because of our human flesh. He was bearing our human flesh. And Romans says that he bore our sinful human flesh. He was touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He felt that tug. He sensed that separation. Even though it was, he was not really separated. He was crying out in agony for assurance. And that's when the voice came, this is my beloved son and whom I am well pleased. He was in our flesh. And if we see ourselves by faith as in him, then I believe that that is a baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, what does that do? How does that furnish our soul? How does that strengthen us for relationships? How does that give us the fruit of the Spirit? It gives us the peace that passes understanding. It gives us love directly from the heart of God. It gives us joy. It gives us that assurance and confidence and we go back to Desire of Ages <clears throat> that Jesus spent time. From hours spent with God, he came forth morning by morning to bring the light of heaven to men. Daily he received a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit. In the early hours of the new day, the Lord awakened him from his slumber, and his soul and his lips were anointed with grace that he might impart to others. His words were given him fresh from the heavenly courts, word that he might speak in season to the weary and the press. The Lord hath given me, he said, the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. So when we think about relationships, if Christ is dwelling in our heart and if we have been empowered by the Holy Spirit, that will give us the strength to follow what the Bible says, to confess our faults. You know, so often we try to protect our pride and try to build ourselves up because of our lack of self-confidence. But if God says, you're okay, not only are you okay, you're my beloved son, you're my beloved daughter, I'm well pleased with you not because of what you haven't done or what you're about to do, but what he has done through you. Also, uh, Matthew 18, the principle of go and tell the person their fault. 
uh, the person who has committed something against you. Uh, is that practice very often? He said, it's not very easy to do, is it? But, you know, the way in which we do that makes a big difference. Because uh, you know that, that body language is important. You know that, uh, that we speak a lot with body language. Uh, Spirit of Prophecy says that, uh, do you know what the disciples were doing while Jesus was teaching? He said that they were watching the people. They were looking at faces. And if they saw some that were, then they knew something about that person. If they saw some who were just eagerly listening, then they were told to go to that person and, and follow up and talk to them because they could see in their countenance that they were experiencing something. And the, the, the inspired counsel says that when we go to talk to someone who has committed something against us, it says not even in a look should we express any superiority. So expressions can tell kind of what's going on in our heart, but the Holy Spirit can give us genuine compassion, words that are kind and expressive of love if we talk to someone who has committed something against us. Only the Holy Spirit can help us to be humble. Because if we realize that our worth is not in who we are, but in who He is, that's humbling, isn't it? And um, there's so many ways that pride gets in the way of broken relationships. It's almost always pride. And uh, I heard a story about uh, two brothers who somehow had lived apart for a long, long time because of pride. And in their old age, one of them got on his riding mower. Did you read that story? And he rode his riding mower a lot of miles down the highway to find his brother and to be reconciled. And it's the Holy Spirit that can keep us humble. The Bible says to be reconciled. Sometimes people are afraid to do that. The Bible talks about one who lays down his life for his friend. And almost always when there's a problem with relationship, it's that we are failing to follow this admonition. And another text that says, let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ, that you stand fast in the, with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. And do you find that uh, doctrinal differences is attacking your church? Um, one church has been closed, I think, indefinitely for, uh, you know, the debate over the doctrine of the Trinity. And we can have differences, but somehow if those differences if that enters into our personality where we won't associate with some people and uh, we can't relate to people, the enemy loves to get into those th things. So we can pray about these kinds of differences, but only the Holy Spirit can accomplish the reconciliation. The Bible says that we could tell truth, we should tell truth, we should love one another, be kind-hearted, tender, not forsaking the assemblance of the assembly of yourselves together. Sometimes people will stay away from church, away from some meetings, because, uh, well, I don't know what so and so's doing, or somebody's a hypocrite. Uh, the Holy Spirit will change all of that. Forbearing, forgiving one another. Restore one another 
was overtaken in a fault, honor preferring one another. So what about abusive relationships? You know, sometimes uh, someone might ask you as a prayer coordinator to uh, pray for Sally because her husband is uh, abusing their daughter. Well, what do you do in a situation like that? Um, I would encourage Sally to involve the law if, there, if there's no other way to deal with it. I mean, you can, you can leave, you can get away from it. And the, my wife says, well, that, are you sure that's biblical? I know that this text says if they persecute you in one city, flee to another, but uh, I think that it applies some to, to some relationships, some homes. Uh, at this point, uh, we kind of shift gears into uh, relationships with children. Are there any thoughts, any questions, any observations at this point? Okay, there's some things that, um, besides emotional intelligence that we should become aware of, there are certain principles involved in relating to children that are ideal. And oftentimes you'll be asked to pray for families, you know. I, I one time had a request, a lady called me on the phone and asked me if I would uh, come and cast a demon out of her son. Now, what would you do if someone asked you to come and cast out a demon from a son or a daughter? <laughs> we, we need to be aware that there can be other things going on, right? Uh, I'm not quite here. Uh, I wish we were in a closed circle where we could talk here, but um, try again. We're not capable of casting out demons. It's only by his power and his spirit. Um, I want to. I want to hear what you're saying. You say we're not capable no. of casting out. <laughs> okay. No. Yeah. Bad yeah, okay. So we could pray over that person. Yeah. Um, Only God and Jesus. Yeah. And his spirit can cast out the demons. Okay, but I want to go even further. I want to go back. Are we sure that that boy is possessed of a demon? Mm -hmm. I mean, how do we know? without understanding some things about uh, childhood behavior, uh, whether that person is actually possessed of a demon. Uh, sometimes kids can have allergies that make them act like they're possessed of a demon. Sometimes there can be addictions. Sometimes there can be... Um, it's amazing what happens with too much sugar in kids these days. So what are the ingredients that go in to child conduct? conduct? First of all, uh, a father's example is the most powerful influence on the son's character. And if we know some of these things, we might not be able to change that, but we might be able to help a person see uh, what, or get some instruction in, in child behavior. Uh, we can pray for healed relationships. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, the word in season to the one who is weary. Uh, the Lord will give us words of comfort to the person who is oppressed. And uh, that mother, for certain, we can, we can pray with her and we can speak words of courage from the Bible. So what are the factors that shape character? What are the ingredients that go into good parenting? 
uh, knowledge of right and wrong. And children basically learn half the basic difference between right and wrong between the ages of one and three. Love. Character research, uh, the findings of psychology indicate that the father love is the best possible motivation about which to integrate personality. So as we're thinking about praying for some of these relationships, we can just uh, kind of evaluate, well, is there a good relationship with the father, with the mother? And how does that plug into the issue? Uh, it's interesting that also a father's love is the most powerful ingredient to a girl's sense of power. Now, sense of power um, is kind of confidence uh, in their ability to accomplish things. And uh, it says a father's love is the most powerful ingredient into a young woman's <coughs> sense of confidence and power. And how does this young girl interpret the father's love? It's whether he is sensitive to her sorrows and failures, whether he's sympathetic. So uh, you can have uh, classes in uh, child raising. Another ingredient is discipline. And kids have a tendency to be in control today. Uh, book Education says that one of the first lessons a child needs to learn is the lesson of obedience. Before is old enough to reason, he may be taught to obey. But while many err upon the side of indulgence, others go the opposite direction and rule their children with a rod of iron. So uh, how do we discipline? The best way to discipline? Just a little window on discipline um, they have done studies on what kind of discipline is effective with children. And they did some scientific experiments. Now, they don't do these anymore because they are outlawed. And I think it's good for them to outlaw these kind of experience, I don't, experiments. I don't think you exp should experiment with kids. But one of the things that they did and they were trying to test the effect of certain kinds of application or discipline on a child in relation to the outcome. By the way, there is a study, a longitudinal study that took a number of, of young people and followed them all through their life from adolescence uh, to teens and measured the various ingredients that went into their experience and the kind of character that was produced by these. Uh, that's that's Hoff, Shorn, and May is the longitudinal study. Very interesting study. But this other study I'm talking about was on the effect of discipline. And so they worked with twins. Now they thought that twins, you know, probably have a lot of things in common. So they did what they called a treatment on one twin and a different treatment on the other twin. And the treatment was something like this. They would have a, a room with a toy set up on a track, and then they would have a distractor in this room. And so the person who was administering the test, they took one of the twins, put them in this room, and they told them, now when this little toy car goes around this track, if you keep watching it, it'll stay on the track. If you take your eyes off of it, it will jump off the track. And if it jumps off the track, and then they changed the words a little bit. They said uh, they, they were going to use some different words. So they put the first twin in and ran around the track, and the administrator had a fire truck in the same room. And he would push a button, and this fire truck would start flashing lights, and the siren would go off. So naturally, would take their eyes off the track and look at the fire truck. And then he had a button that he would push and the little toy would jump off the track. Now, he did that with both, set of, with both twins, but then the administrator would come in and he would say something different to this twin than this twin. To the first twin, he would say, ah, I see you took your eyes off the track. I see that the toy jumped off and it probably broke. And 
I see that I caught you when it jumped off the track. And so that's, you know, that was one treatment. The other treatment was, okay, the same thing, it jumped off the track. I bet you felt badly when it jumped off the track. Now you see the two, diff the two different approaches? One was saying the child himself felt badly. They emphasized that. The other approach was you felt badly when you got caught. So if a child grows up with the idea that they are going to feel bad if they get caught versus they're going to feel bad if they themselves feel the responsibility. That's called internal or external locus of control. So now they outlawed that because it's not good to treat kids that way. But it does teach that in discipline, if we can help a child to develop self-discipline, then that is going to strengthen their adult life. Well, knowing some of those kind of things, it's not that you can teach parents that, but you can bring people in to have classes in child development that will help with some of those things. Health. Essential. The eight basic laws. The allergies and sugars that we've mentioned. Uh, this statement from education says, the will should be guided and molded, but not ignored or crushed. And when there is a clash of wills, if the child has a stubborn will, the mother, if she understands her responsibility, will realize that this stubborn will is part of the inheritance she has given him. She will not look upon his will as something that must be broken. So these statements that you're familiar with, but this is an interesting diagram that has been developed through research on the brain. And this is supposed to represent a, a magnification of lines on the brain. And you can see the side there is a decision point. And it kind of um, diagrams this decision point, And you can see that it uh, goes down two different tracks. And then some of those tracks separate. So if the child can make the right decision at the right time, that ball will roll down into the right uh, side and will have a tendency to impact that child for the future. And that will be the characteristic of that child in the future. So the key is to try to help the child make good decisions. So choice making is an essential part of helping a child to develop character. So no harsh or extreme discipline, discipline for self-control. Some of the things that are negative would be harsh physical punishment, harsh verbal abuse, anger, frustration, name calling, association with negative models. You know, for instance, this one on association with negative model, you never want to say to a kid, if you don't stop doing that, you're going to turn out just like Uncle Harry, who's in prison. See, that's, that's planning an idea, and the kid will see themselves that way. So I don't want to spend too much time on this, but the thing that I think is helpful is uh, to encourage love, if we wish our children to possess a tender spirit of Jesus and the sympathy that angels manifest for us, we must encourage the generous loving impulses of childhood. And as a mother teaches her children to obey her, they love her, she is, to obey because they love her, she is teaching them the first lesson in the Christian life. And uh, you remember the story of the little boy who gave his mother a note and said that you owe me uh, a certain amount of money. And uh, on this note, he said, Mother owes Bradley 
25 cents for running errands, 10 cents for being good, 15 cents for taking music lessons, and five cents extra for a total of 55 cents. That was his idea. So mother wrote back a note, and she gave the 55 cents with another bill on Bradley's plate. Bradley owes mother for nursing him through long illness, scarlet fever, nothing, for being good, nothing, for clothes, gloves, and toys, nothing, for all his meals and room, nothing. And Bradley got the point, and he apologized to his mother. So, discipline with love, and experience a daily baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, you're not going to uh, be giving all that information to people who call about relationships they have, but as the prayer coordinator, you can be aware that it may not be enough just to say, I'll pray for you, or to get other people to pray for you. Now, the Lord does work through prayer, and he does do amazing things, and brings up ways that those things can come together. But I have kind of seen, I answer uh, prayer requests online, sometimes get two a day or more. And some of the things that I have people praying for, I realize are in an area that need some other assistance. Because we are mental, physical, spiritual, emotional beings. And I can see that there's a lot of these dynamics and most of the relational things that people ask for prayer for. So it's good to be able to know how to discern when people ask for prayer, whether that's, yes, we can pray for this, but have you considered uh, exploring some of these other possibilities uh, in, to help answer, answer your prayer? Are there any thoughts or comments, questions? Okay. where they actually do not want to associate in face-to-face -face relationships. They much prefer to go online. And they don't, I, I have a nephew who does not leave the home. And he plays video games, he's 300 pounds, and he screams out the door what he wants to eat from his mother. How do you help these ones? Because he literally is anxious about everything because he's been allowed to see on the internet all of this perversity. He's so confused and so anxious. What do you do to, what do you do to give them some, some help? Well, I wish I had an easy answer for that. No, that's not an easy answer. Um, and I know that there are some programs that I've seen dealing with young people and the internet and uh, usually it involves some kind of a strict control. Um, and That's the biggest part of the problem. There are no yeah, problems. and if there's if there is no strict control, then it's kind of as a grandma. I mean, as grandparents, you know, they sometimes suffer the most. But you know, just by way of encouragement, grandparents are probably some of the greatest influences in the life of young people. When I was in high school, like I say, I wasn't rebellious, but I was careless and not keeping Sabbath. Uh, from the time get-go, my grandma, whenever she would come and visit, she would institute reforms. <laughs> and uh, she, first thing she did is took candy off the table. And uh, then she, taught my mom things about like a soy milk and all those kinds of things. We, we used to call her Grandma Soy. Uh, I still have my teeth, by the way. <laughs> so Grandma was a good influence. My little brother, he would sit around and listen to my mom and my grandma talk. And when I was in high school, um, he came and told me what Grandma said. 
Well, I heard Grandma say that when, in Bible days, when they had a teenager that was rebellious, they'd take him out and stone him. <laughs> that wasn't lost on me, you know. It was probably part of the thing that the Holy Spirit drawing me back in, and and it was love, really. I mean, my grandma loved me, and. And uh, my dad and my mom loved me. I had a pastor there who used to play football in Seattle. Uh, he was very kind to me, played sports with me, uh, made all the difference in the world. You know, from that, from that meager beginning, the Lord has sent me all around the world. He's taught college in the Middle East and in Africa and pastored a number of churches, uh, seen many, many people come to the Lord through what God can do. And when I was in college training for theology, uh, one day my grandma came to visit. And uh, we sang a closing song. If it be that death cold finger touched my feeble mortal, mortal clay. And she slipped a $10 bill in my hand. I thank God for grandmas. Well, let's finish with prayer. Lord, you're so good. You're so merciful. We are so helpless, but we are not without hope. You have said, I will pour water upon him that is thirsty. I will pour my flood upon the dry ground. I'll pour my blessing upon your seed. That's our children. That's our grandchildren my spirit upon your seed and my blessing upon your offspring, and they shall spring up as among grass, as willows by the water courses. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, to our hearts. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Bless these children and grandchildren that we're praying for, and give guidance to these dear prayer leaders to uh, continue to, do, to perhaps suggest resources that can help, but Lord, heal us and we should be healed. And we thank you in Jesus' name.